a few months ago, believe it or not, we jumped into a study working through the book of Colossians. We're back in it. We took a couple week break through uh, the Easter season as we gazed upon the empty tomb. But this morning we're gonna jump back into Colossians being reminded of the life that comes through knowing Jesus. And we've walked through the book of Colossians with this illustration before us, a tree that's deeply rooted and we're challenging one another as Paul challenged the church in Colossae to be deeply rooted in Christ, talking about subsurface type stuff that we can't bear fruit from seed that we haven't sown. And Paul focuses the first chapter on what it means to know Jesus as creator, what it means to know Jesus as savior, as the one who's preeminent over all things, as the one who is reconciler of all things in heaven and on earth. And he moves from this beautiful Christ-centered text to uh, disclosing very clearly to us what the mystery of the gospel is. And we're in the second part of this three-part series working through the book of Colossians, exposing the mystery of the gospel as Paul would describe it to the church in Colossae, that for centuries God had promised to crush sin and crush Satan, and he fulfilled that promise through Jesus. And through the gospel, the good news of Jesus, we can know Christ, not just as creator. All people will one day stand before Jesus, according to Philippians chapter two, and they will bow their knee and they'll they'll confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's sovereign over all creation, but that we can know the creator, not just as the creator, but we can know him as savior. We can know him as the one who's reconciled all things to himself, the one who is preeminent in our life. And as we journeyed into the... uh, Uh, part that we're focusing on the mystery of the gospel. We've talked about how when we come to know Jesus, we gain a new pursuit. We gain a new purpose. We gain a new power, ultimately gaining a new life that bears abundant fruit. See, last time we were in Colossians, we talked about how all people uh, will ultimately bear barren fruit. They'll bear bad fruit or through the renewed and new work of Jesus, they'll bear Good fruit, we have three categories. Our life is producing some type of fruit and those around us can see that fruit in our life. This week, we're gonna talk about this new life, this new power that comes through Jesus. And Paul's gonna engage in uh, one of the most, I think, uh, winsome, arguments that he does within his letters to the church. It's it's a two-part argument. We're gonna begin it this week. We're gonna finish it next week. But this argument really focuses in on this reality that without substance, it doesn't matter what people claim, there's no truth within their claim. I don't know how many of you guys remember watching commercials. I'm gonna start there. Anyone ever watch a commercial? Like I know we, we do on-demand TV now and we, we record stuff and we fast forward through commercials. My kids don't watch commercials. Uh, over their spring break, we went to a hotel and we watched Crack, Crackle and it had uh, some commercials that, that we had to watch. And they're like, dad, can we fast forward through this? I'm like, no, believe it or not, we used to have to, this is the only way we could watch TV. We had to watch commercials and we had to watch it live because there was no recording unless you had a cassette, VHS, to put in the, the VCR. I was trying to think, <laughs> I was gonna say DVD player. I'm like, that, that doesn't play v- VHS. Just put it in the VCR and record, right? Pre-record what's going on. Uh, there was a commercial back in the day, a hostess commercial, where they would have animals that would, would attack these things that looked like hostess cupcakes. And the punchline of all these commercials was the animal would get through the, the what looked like a cupcake and they would say, hey, where's the cream filling? Like, where's the substance of what I'm chasing after? You're like, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Will. But we've all gone to maybe a cup that we thought was water and it turned out to be Sprite. Anyone do that? At my house, the ongoing battle for me is my wife does not like coffee and I do not like chai tea. So if we go to Starbucks, she gets chai tea, I get coffee and they're in the same cup. And I'll go grab a coffee cup, what I think's a coffee cup, and I take a swig and the substance isn't the right substance. It's chai tea, right? Anybody do this before? Uh, Oftentimes in our house, we get medicine for our kids. The substance of the medicine is good. It makes them feel better. It takes away the fever. We in our house have bubble gum gum flavored uh, ibuprofen and Motrin and all that good stuff. But not everything that tastes like bubble gum is good for someone's body. It's the substance that makes it good. Are are we tracking here? This is the argument that 
Paul's going to make, that if, 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 if there's an appearance of godliness, he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy, he says, there are things, there are philosophies of life that have an appearance of godliness, but they lack the power behind what produces godliness or, or transformed new life type behavior in our life. There's no substance, there's no power that produces the change. And so we chase after the change without chasing after the Savior. And the whole book of Colossians is, is driving us through this argument that apart from being deeply rooted in Christ, the fruit of our life will be barren or bad. But in Christ, there's a new life that's found. There's a substance that's found. We're not chasing after the shadows he's gonna talk about next week that, that gives indication of what's to come, but we're chasing after the substance that is Jesus. And according to John chapter 15, he who abides in Jesus will bear much fruit, but apart from him, we can do nothing. Here's, here's the argument that religiosity and regulations that are void of Christ are ultimately void of life. If we put restrictions and modifications on our life that aren't deeply rooted in Christ, they're not going to produce within our life abundant life that Jesus offers. And, and as we've been journeying through Colossians, we've been reminded again and again and again that God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. And that purpose begins, doesn't end when we come to know Jesus. But when we come to know Jesus, we're set free for this new purpose, this new pursuit, uh, uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit to live this new life. So that's where we're going to be this morning. We're going to jump into Colossians chapter 2, pick up at verse 8, move through verse 15. It's on page 772 in the Bibles that we've provided for you. And I ask you to join me in praying before we jump into the text this morning. God, we are thankful. Lord, we're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for the life that we have through Christ. That it's not simply an appearance of godliness, lacking the power that produces within us a new life, a transformed life, but it's a godliness that has been imparted to us through faith in Jesus and then a work that's done in us through the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. And Father, as we uh, come to your word again this morning, we do so humbly asking that you would use it to shape our lives, to produce good fruit in our life. And Lord, we don't wanna chase after the fruit. We wanna chase after new, you knowing that you're the one that bears the fruit. And so God, before we transition into the next portion of the text, uh, talking about the freedom, talking about the lifestyle, talking about the marriage and the parenting and all that comes with knowing you, Father, might you do a, uh, a new and renewed work in our life, reminding us that we, we don't chase after those things apart from you, but we chase after you and you produce those things within our life. So God, we love you and we commit this time to you. We ask these things in your name, amen. Colossians chapter two, uh, we're picking up at verse eight. Uh, Paul says this, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive. This word captive means to be a spoil of someone's war. Right, so we all understand kind of modern warfare. A POW would be a prisoner of war. And Paul's saying, I don't want you to be a POW in this spiritual warfare that's going on around you. I don't want you to be taken captive by philosophies and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. All of us have a philosophy or, or what we would describe as a worldview that governs the things that we do. All of us do. You might say, I don't like philosophy. Philosophy just simply means a love of wisdom. Phileo means love. Sophia means wisdom. Sophia, we t attach in high school to uh, moros and call our 10th graders sophomores, which means a wise moron. That's a fun fact for you. All of us need wisdom to govern our life. And when we think through what it means to not be taken captive by a philosophy or an empty deceit. It's, it's rooted in human tradition and according to the, the physical, elemental spirits and, and principles of this world, not according to Christ. Verse nine, for in Christ, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So in chapter one, he calls Jesus the head of the church. Here he's saying he's the head of all things. He's the ruler of all things. In him, verse 11, all you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, two illustrations that he uses, circumcision, a spiritual circumcision and baptism. 
being buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with all of its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and he disarmed, he dis, uh, d- dethroned the rulers and the authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So we are spiritually transformed in Christ because of the mystery of the gospel. Because the gospel has come, the good news of Jesus has come. We can see within our lives a transformation that we all so desperately long for. All of us are looking at the same problem. Whether you're atheist, whether you're agnostic, whether you're a God-fearer, all of us are looking at the same problem, saying, like, what's the meaning of life? How do we see transformation and change and growth in our life? How do we reach the capacity and the potential for which God had, has created and wired us for? And, and for this, the, the secular, atheist, agnostic, they're saying, well, I want to reach my potential. I don't know if it was a part of the original design, but I, I want to reach my potential. All of us are looking at the same problem. And, and Paul's saying that spiritual transformation comes through Christ because the gospel has come. The good news of Jesus has come. He has set us free from the domain of darkness and death. He's set us free from the captivity and the bondage that would come from living by the principles and the philosophies of this world. And he's called us to a new life, a life that's rooted, deeply rooted in Christ. And spiritual transformation requires us to be rooted in the truth of Christ's word. The truth of Christ in Christ's word. Transformation comes from being not only rooted in Christ's word, but allowing Christ's word to have authority over our life. See, when I read scripture, I don't get to tell scripture what it says to me, but scripture gets to tell me what it says. When I give it that position of authority in my life, it begins to shape my life by the principles of Christ. Philosophy is not a bad thing. A love of wisdom's not a bad thing, but when we chase after wisdom in the wrong places, it leads us to the wrong destinations. Here's the truth. A philosophy that's birthed within the heart and the mind of man will ultimately end in the folly of that man. If we are the ones who produce within our lives that which governs our life, we have one one of two ends. One, the world centers around us. Good luck, other six plus billion people in the world. We're like, okay, well, that can't be how we develop our worldview, centering it around us. Like I see my two-year-old kid and I see how that doesn't work when we're shopping in the store. That's not cool. So the other extreme that we go to is, well, we have six billion plus people who are right and their worldview just gets to center around them and everybody gets their own right and truth and and they get to make their own claims. Then all of a sudden we see, well, there's competing values. Like whose claim to truth gets to win? You say, well, uh, most popular, uh, let's, let's vote on it, and whoever has the most popular uh, truth claim, we'll let, we'll let them win, and, and yet we look throughout history, and we see a lot of really horrific things happened that were popular, and we're led by leaders, and Paul's saying, he's saying, uh, wisdom doesn't uh, find itself rooted in, uh, in man, in the physical, elemental principles of this world, but Wisdom's found in Christ. Here's a couple examples of of some philosophers over the centuries who have tried to figure out how to reason out purpose in life. Frederick Nietzsche, a German philosopher in the 19th century, he said, God is dead. And in interacting with Nietzsche's claim uh, in Dust of the Death, uh, Guinness, uh, the author, points out that in order for Nietzsche to be consistent, he needed to become his own superman. If God's dead, then I have to uh, be the Superman of the world. I have to be the savior of the world. And and Nietzsche came to the conclusion in the latter part of his life, he's like, I I don't have the capacity to be Superman. Like I'm not strong enough, I'm not capable enough, I'm not wise enough. And he he Nietzsche said that the only freedom from this, this weighty responsibility of being the savior of the world is insanity or madness, he said. In the last 11 years of Nietzsche's life, he spent uh, clinically insane, mad because of this responsibility, this weighty philosophy of if God's dead, then the world's problems reside on my shoulders and I just can't handle them. And the only freedom from this weight is for me to become mad. 
another guy, French philosopher, he says, every existing thing is born without reason, goes on living out of weakness, and dies by accident. Hashtag purpose of life. Earlier in his writing, he expressed his consideration of suicide, but his con conclusion about suicide in his life, this, is, this was his worldview, this was his philosophy about life. Everything exists without reason, it goes on in weakness and it dies by accident. He's like, so I'm just gonna kill myself. And he's like, wait, there's no purpose in that. Like that was his reason for not killing himself because it was meaningless too. Like everything is just random, it's meaningless. See, philosophies that begin with man at the center will end with man in the center and they will ultimately rob us of the meaning and significance of our life, which is realized in Christ. See, what was happening in the Colossian church was uh, Epaphras had come to know the gospel through Paul's ministry in Ephesus and he went back to the region of Colossae and, and these tri-cities, Aeropolis and Laodicea, and he began to, to share this good news of Jesus and people began to get saved and, and other people came in, they began to undermine the gospel, say, no, uh, that, that, that truth that's rooted in Christ, it, it can't be real, it can't be right. You have to have these additional restrictions, these additional regulations, these additional laws placed on your life and, and from those rules you'll find abundant living. We're going to focus in on that next week. And Paul here is saying like, don't be taken captive when Christ has set you free. The captivity comes from these philosophies and, and these deceptions that are rooted in human tradition according to the elemental spirits of this world, not according to Christ. And so if Christ has set you free, be free indeed. And last week in Easter, we talked about the freedom that comes from Christ, how we conquered sin, conquered death. And here again, we're reminding the Colossians that Christ is the one who sets us free. Spiritual transformation requires us not to be rooted in, in claims, truth claims of man, but in the truthful claim of Christ in Christ's word. See, here's the mathematics of human philosophy. Now, those mathematicians out there, you're like, yes, you're speaking my language. Like, math lost me at imaginary numbers. So that tells you when, like, I, okay, math went this way and Will went the other way. My teacher wanted to say, like, why don't you get this? I'm like, I, how do you imagine the right number? I'm just not, I'm not there with you. Mathematics of, of human philosophy, addition, adding to Scripture. When we add to Scripture, when we add to the truth claims of Jesus, we walk a slippery slope it doesn't mean that truth can't be found outside scripture. All truth is God's truth, that which is really true. Okay, so we're not afraid to look into the microscope, nor are we afraid to look in the telescope. But all that gets weighed against scripture. There have been many uh, men and women throughout the centuries who have come in with truth claims and, and adding to scripture stripped the very power for transformation. We have a dear friend, family friend, whose mother and sister were a part of the Jim Jones cult, People Temple. I don't know if you remember uh, that back in the 60s or so. They were part of the 900. When, when people say don't drink the juice, don't drink the Kool-Aid, that, that's a reference to Jim Jones. They were part of the 900 who committed suicide in, in I think it was Guyana. Uh, there was a man who came and added to scripture and truth claims to that scripture. When we add to scripture, we begin to find ourselves slipping into the captivity that's rooted in human philosophy and human tradition. The second is subtracting from the sufficiency of Christ's work and Christ's nature. When we subtract from the, the sufficiency of Jesus, we strip Christianity of all that makes it wonderful. See, what makes Christianity wonderful is that Jesus is uniquely qualified to become our substitute who took our debt on our, his shoulders so that we might take his righteousness by faith on our shoulders. Jesus is uniquely qualified because he was without sin, according to Hebrews. He's the high priest who was tempted in every way, but yet walked through those temptations sinlessly, flawlessly, perfectly. He's fully God here in this text. Whole fullness of deity dwelled in bodily form. That's in Christ. And when we subtract from the nature of Christ and the work of Christ, we find ourselves being taken captive by a philosophy that would strip us of the potential that God would desire for a life. Multiplication, multiplying the means of salvation. When we multiply the means of salvation, this is certainly a popular a trend within our world. When we multiply means of salvation, 
Say there's multiple ways to heaven. There's multiple ways to forgiveness. What have we done? We've robbed Christ of the sufficient work of the cross. And it becomes about oftentimes you and I and our behavior. And and let me just remind you of Nietzsche's response to this Superman complex. The only freedom from being perfect is madness. Like, just make me go insane because I can't be perfect. I can't be the Superman that I know the world needs. But Jesus was the Superman. He was the superhero. He was the perfect substitutionary atonement, that perfect sacrifice that took our place. He is the means of salvation. When we multiply it, we strip the gospel of its power, which is rooted in Christ. And then division, division within the church. Right? Like, like I got the corner on the block of the gospel. If we look at the, the book of Jude, one of my favorite epistles, really short. Uh, Jude says he wants to write about the salvation in which he shares with people. But he says, I, I felt that I had to write to you to contend for the faith that was entrusted, not just to me, but to the saints, to the church. That doesn't mean that, that we get to go around and, and say whatever we want, but that the truth has been entrusted not to one person, not to two people, but to the saints, the body of of Christ, Christ of whom is the head. And then Paul goes into two illustrations talking about this transformation that comes from being rooted in the truth of Christ. He he goes into the illustration of of baptism and circumcision. Both these illustrations are intended to demonstrate a covenant. Again, the Old Testament circumcision demonstrated that, that, that the Israelites were a part of the covenantal relationship with God. Baptism's the, the new covenant that's come, and when we, when we are baptized, we identify with Christ in his death and are raised to walk in the newness of life. Uh, you're like, well, I don't, I don't get circumcision, I don't get baptism. It's, it's, a, it's a demonstration of a covenant, much like a wedding ring would be a demonstration of a covenant. I, I take it off, it's not like I'm not married all of a sudden. Covenant on, I have to be faithful now. Set my wedding ring to the side, and now I get to do whatever I want. That's not how the wedding ring works. It's, it's a demonstration of a commitment that, that I said to my wife that for better or for worse in, in sickness and in health and richer, which we haven't yet experienced, and in poorer, that I'd be faithful to her. Whether the ring's on or not, the covenant's there, but the, the ring's a symbol. It's a demonstration that there's a relational component there between me and my spouse. The same is true with baptism. You say, why why do people get baptized? They get baptized because they wanna show those around them that there's a covenant relationship that's been established through the work of Christ and we're identifying publicly with Christ in his baptism, his burial, buried with him in death, raised to walk with him in newness of life. It's a demonstration of that new work that's gone on in our heart. It's a covenantal relationship that was established by Jesus' blood. That's why we participate in the Lord's Supper, to demonstrate that that covenant was established through Jesus in his blood. The second truth about transformation, spiritual transformation, requires us to be rooted in the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. Verses 11 through 15. In him, he talks about circumcision, baptism. We're gonna move into 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses... He says it similarly in uh, Ephesians chapter two. He says, you were once dead in your trespasses. Now, <clears throat> when my kids come into my room to, to make sure that I'm, I'm alive, uh, what do they do? And they tap my shoulder. Occasionally, they'll tickle me. It's a dangerous game when you tickle dad when he's asleep. And because I'm alive, I respond to that physical stimuli, right? I'm alive, physical stimuli, is I'm able to respond to it. Paul's saying you were dead in your trespasses. And so apart from a divine work stepping in, it's not like you just need a little rub to to wake you up, that you were asleep in your trespasses. You were dead, spiritually dead in your trespasses. Ephesians 2 says, but God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ. Here he's gonna say, you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You were apart from that covenantal relationship with God but God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. I wanna hang here for a second. This record of debt translates to something that is written uh, with a hand. When when someone was arrested or when someone was crucified, there was literally a handwriting of the debt that that person owed. They would hang that on the cross in the Roman world, of the debt that, that weighed on that person and why they were crucified. For Jesus, we see that, uh, that 
what was written on his cross was that he was the king of the Jews. That was the debt that man brought against him, but the, God, the debt that God allowed to be laid on Christ wasn't that he was the king of the Jews, but that he would be the savior of the world. And so the sin of man was written on Christ's account so that his payment could satisfy your debt. See, this legal decree refers to uh, the Mosaic law, that all of us have fallen short of perfection. All of us fall short of perfection. This record of debt stands against us and it has legal claims and weights, spiritually legal claims and weights. And yet the God who is just is also the justifier. It's a beautiful truth because when we think about transformation, oftentimes we think about falling short and we think, man, I, I, I get up and I take two steps forward and, and I fall down and it moves me three steps back and I get up and I take one step forward and I, I move two steps back. We just, we feel like we're on this cycle of moving a little forward, a little back and we become frustrated. And oftentimes apart from Christ and a, a renewed understanding of the work of the cross, we're like, man, this is just never gonna work. But yet in the cross, we see that God has justified us, declared us righteous. And through the cross, he, he, he gives us the Holy Spirit who is making us righteous. When we don't understand the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice, we take the work that Christ has done and we place it on our shoulders and it becomes a burdensome thing that we ourselves can't handle. We just simply can't handle that weight, nor can we satisfy that debt. Uh, here's, here's what uh, one author says, R.C. Sproul. He says, there's two ways that God's justice can be satisfied with respect to your sin. Either you satisfy it or Christ satisfies it. You can satisfy it by being banished from God's presence forever, or you can accept the satisfaction that Jesus Christ has made. See, here in this text, we see that Christ has sufficiently and completely satisfied this legal demand that stands against us by canceling the record of debt. The, the claims that can be brought against us, Jesus has stamped and he's paid them in full. And we move forward to verse 14. He canceled the debt. Uh, this he set aside by nailing it to the cross. Literally, uh, this debt that was owed was erased. The Greek here uh, means to be wiped away, much like you would wipe away a whiteboard with no trace of, of the debt that stood against us, the, the demands that stand against us. Christ nailed them to the cross, satisfying them in completion. And in doing so, he disarmed those that would have claims, spiritual claims on our life. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities by putting them to open shame, by triumphing over them in him. So twice in this text, Paul turns to kind of warfare type language. Earlier in the text, he says, don't be taken captive. And later in the text, he, he says, there's an open shaming, a triumphing over these enemies that would seek to have authority over your life. This, this refers back to what would happen in ancient warfare when, when someone would be would be uh, taken over, uh, a land would be taken captive, and those who survived the war would be brought back to the city that triumphed, and they'd be paraded through the streets, and the shouts of victory would be known throughout the whole city because as the, 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 the authorities were disarmed, the rulers were disarmed. Everybody had this open awareness that they no longer have authority over our kingdom. We no longer have to be afraid of their threats on our kingdom. We no, have, no longer have to be uh, suppressed by what we perceive as their power. There's an open shaming and triumphing over the enemy. And when we look at the cross, we see that it was not a private uh, spectacle, but it was displayed for all creation to see. So that centuries past would look forward to the future work of the Messiah and they would have faith in that work and by faith, God would credit righteousness to their account according to uh, many epistles in the New Testament according to what God said to Abraham in the Old Testament. When we look at the New Testament, we see those who look to the cross would find that there's freedom through the triumphing over the rulers and the authorities and we see in the modern world those who look to the cross find freedom over the authorities, the rulers, those that would seek to suppress the work of God in our life, rob us of the potential and the transformation that we so desperately need and desire and long for. 
See, when we chase after transformation through philosophies that don't have any substance to them, we find ourselves frustrated. We oftentimes find ourselves defeated. There are philosophies out there that we can embrace for a season. We're like, okay, where's this leading? We, we, we drink the bubble gum juice without any medicine in it, right? Like there's all kinds of bubble gum flavors out there, but not all of them are good for us. There's a philosophy in this world that would seek probably uh, sometimes even with good intentions, but seek to produce within your life a greater potential, a greater capacity, a greater fruitfulness. But as we've, as we've talked about throughout the book of Colossians, uh, we bear the seed or the fruit from the seed that, which, that has been sown. And seeds that are sown in the flesh reap fruit that's sown by the flesh, which is ultimately bad. We're at, on a better level, maybe barren. The seed that's sown in Christ bears within us good fruit. It's not only pleasing to God, but pleasing to self and pleasing to others. To Jesus' work, he's reconciling things in heaven and on earth unto himself. And I'll tell you what, when we find that reconciliation with God, it's easier to engage in reconciling work with others. When we find that forgiveness from God, it, it becomes a starting place to engage in forgiveness of others. When we find that that record of debt has been canceled for us by God, it's easier to cancel the debts that others might owe us. When we see that God has, through the work of Christ, sufficiently satisfied all that would stand against us, we can walk confidently, courageously into the worlds of others. C.J. Mahaney writes this. He says, the personal desolation Christ is experiencing on the cross is what you and I should have been experiencing instead of Jesus. He's bearing it alone. Why alone? He's all alone so that you and I may never have to be alone. See, the fact is that Jesus was forsaken, he was rejected so that you could be accepted, so that you could find that new life, that abundant life, that transformed life that comes through being deeply rooted in Christ. And Paul warns that there are other truth claims out there. There are things that would seek to rob you of that transformation. There are, there are testimonies and truth claims that would seek to put that weight on your shoulders, a weight that is crushing, a weight that is overburdensome. Uh, but Paul says, no, that weight's been carried by Christ. So let me end with this. We as a people, I think, have a identity crisis that plagues those within our church and those within our communities. I think we have an identity crisis that's void of its greatest value. Identity crisis where we seek to find ourselves apart from Christ and at best we find some dim shadow or picture of who we are. But Christ is the one who created us if we look back to Colossians chapter one. We were created by him, we were created for him. And in him, we can find the identity which we have uh, longed for the identity which gives us meaning, which gives us purpose. We either think too much of ourselves or we think too little of Christ or we do a combination of both. And Paul here is saying, think much of Christ, think often of Christ, think much of Christ's word, think much of Christ's work. And as we meditate on the work and the word of Christ, all of a sudden it, be it begins to transform us from the inside out. We're gonna talk more about this in the weeks to come. Chapter three talks about setting your mind on things above, setting your mind on, on the word of Christ. But before we transition into that, this is our last time in, in the mystery of the gospel before we jump into the fruit of the gospel. And I'm gonna remind us over and over and over again that the fruit of the gospel is a product of knowing Christ because so often we fail to recognize that the fruit that we wanna cut out of our life it's not, we, we don't simply ch chase after behavior modification, but we chase after Christ and Christ changes our life, transforms our life. Let's pray. God, we're thankful. Uh, Lord, we know uh, that we as people are in need of a uh, renewed perspective of who you are. Father, that we need to uh, 
uh, be reminded by your word of the sufficiency of your work, that we might not labor in vain, that we might not chase after things that have no substance, have no value, have no worth, but that God, by your grace, we would find Christ. And in finding Christ, we go from death to life because you're a God who's rich in mercy. You're a God who stepped in and satisfied the debt that stood against us so that we can stand before you qualified complete, lacking nothing. So that when the accusers come at us in life, both physically and spiritually, we can just look to the cross and say it's been satisfied. The debt's been paid. We can be set free from that bondage of trying to earn your favor, trying to earn your forgiveness, because we in ourselves never can be sufficient to do that, but you and your grace made Christ sufficient. So God, as we think through this new purpose, this new pursuit, this new life, this new power that comes through Christ, might we do so through the lens of, of knowing that transformation comes from being deeply rooted in your word and being deeply rooted in confidence in your sufficient Lord, would you remind us, would you renew us, would you strengthen us in that truth? We love you, Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you stay with us and sing?
to hear your voice We're hanging on every word Amen, amen. I hope you go into this week encouraged, uh, reminded that the work that Jesus has done is sufficient and the word of Jesus is sufficient to transform and inform our life. Two things real quick. One, uh, life groups get started back up this week. If you're not connected to a life group, I highly encourage you to consider it. It's where we do life on life, and we believe that community happens in uh, life groups. And so uh, certainly there's an invitation to you. We took 10 weeks in the early uh, spring uh, late winter session, took a two-week break, so we're just jumping back on board. There's going to be new, new faces. It'd be a great time to get connected if you're interested. We're going to go in for another 10-week session before summer break. Uh, the other thing is I just want to thank those uh, who give faithfully. There's an offering box on the way out, and so much of what we do uh, is able to be done because of your faithfulness and generosity, and so we're thankful for that. Uh, we're at the end of the first quarter, and so there's going to be some financial information that's out in the next couple of weeks for you guys. And so we're thankful for you, thankful for what God's doing in your life, and be encouraged this week as you live out your faith. God bless. The world.